linearization. And the whole motivation behind linearization is the ability to model a nonlinear system. And this is extremely useful because oftentimes nonlinear systems are really hard to solve or impossible to solve, so we need some way in order to represent what the system will do. Plus, we've also been learning a lot of skills to solve non to solve linear systems, including skills like diagonalization. So before we go into the steps of linearization and how to actually do it, I'm just first going to go over what it means to be linear or what is linear. So specifically, in order for it to be linear, two traits have to be satisfied and one of them is scaling and then the other one is additivity so scaling just means that say you have a function f of x and you want to plug in the value a of x then that value evaluated with the function f should be equal to a of f of x, given that a is a constant. So you should be able to pull that constant out of the function evaluation. And additivity means that if you have f of x plus y, then that should be equal to f of x plus f of y. So these are the definitions that make a function linear. Something to keep in mind is that there's a difference between affine functions versus linear functions. So as an example, f of x is equal to x plus 2 is not a linear function. And that's mainly due to the plus 2 s spec. So instead, this is actually an affine function. And that's a definition to keep in mind. And as a way of visualizing it, affine functions allow like just any line of sorts, but and it doesn't have to go through the origin. But in order for the function to actually be linear under the definition, the function has to be a lie and it also has to go through an origin. So that's why as we see with this example, it is affine because of the plus two of it. Cool. So now since we're comfortable with what it means to be linear, let's go more into actually linearizing the system. So, in order to actually linearizing, we're going to go into like the general aspects of linearization. So the first thing is that we are linearizing based on the Taylor series. So that means we can rewrite f of x to be approximately f of x star plus df dx, so the derivative evaluated at x star times x minus x star and so on. So in terms of linearization, we're just going to take this first uh, section of the Taylor series approximation and be able to rewrite our system based on this. So as we can see here, we are choosing an x star to evaluate at. And this x star we call the expansion point. And a trick that we like to do is have this x star equal to 0 so that we can simplify calculations because then if, since this x star is 0, this value becomes 0, and then instead of having like kind of a delta x of the x variable minus x star, you would just have the x by itself, which simplifies your whole function as well. Plus, it's much easier in general to evaluate things at 0 versus any other numbers because then a lot of terms cancel out. So this is the main format that we're going to, and we do hope that the expansion point 
Oh, and by the way, this is also called the equilibrium point. to be equal to zero. And sometimes it may not be possible or may be difficult to find this, but when you can, please just have it set equal to zero and it will simplify your linearization by a lot. Cool. So as you notice right here, the only variable you have is X, right? But that's not usually a case with the system. Usually in a system you have like an x variable representing like your state space but then you also have a u representing the controls you are added so in order to follow suit with that we can just expand this equation in order to include the input of u2 as our controls and then that would mean that f of x of u will become approximately equal to x star u star plus df dx evaluated that x is equal to x star times the same thing plus df du at u is equal to u star times the difference. Cool. So this is more of the main format that we would be using since it also includes the input u. So with input u. Something to keep in mind is that now we even we are taking the derivative of twice, the first time with respect to x, while the second time with respect to u. And similarly, we still have like our equilibrium point. So instead of having this like f of x star be equal to zero, we now want our f of x star u star to be equal to zero. So everything just expands to having two variables and then that's also where your this other derivative term comes in. So these are the main things to keep in mind and something to realize is that after you do your linearization, your system will be in the form of this aspect and then now instead of being originally how your system was in terms of like x and u so your input and your state space now everything is in terms of the function in terms of the distance from your expansion point because instead of it just being x and u it's x minus x star and u minus u star so that's just kind of a subtlety to keep in mind in terms of like how linearization changes your function and this also reminds you that with your linearization scheme the closer you are to your equilibrium point the more accurate or the better approximation your linearization is going to give and that makes sense because like if you're approximating like the slope of a line with a tangent line for example so let's just say like this is like our curve and then we're approximating at slope at this point with this tangent line the approximation as the closer it gets to this point the better it is while the farther you get the least the less accurate it is so it's kind of along that similar sense and then we'll also sometimes realize that our state space representation usually has more than just one x. Usually instead we have like an x vector where we have like x1, x2, and so on. So how do we get linearized in that case? So we realize that we can do the same thing and kind of just have like the same type of format for f1, f2, f3, and so on. So we actually just end up ca like taking all of these derivatives or partial derivatives and combining them. So instead, we'll actually get into the form of f of x of u. So assuming that they are both vectors, will then be equal to the Jacobian of delta x. And then the Jacobian in respect to u delta u. So this is when it's a system. Or 
are vectors plus multidimensional. Here the delta u is similar to earlier with the x minus x star. So it's just denoting the difference instead of writing that out directly, especially since like it would be dependent on whether it is x1 or x2. So specifically, delta x as a function is equal to x1 minus x1 star, x2 minus x2 star, and so on. And then same with delta u is equal to u minus u star, sorry, u1 minus u1 star, u2 minus u2 star, and so on. And then for the Jacobian, it has a general form of for j with respect to x, for example, it is all the partial derivatives. So that means you have df1 of dx1 evaluated at x1 star all the way to df1 of dxn evaluated at xn star and then going vertically down you go all the way to dfm dx1 evaluated at x1 star which leaves this to be dfm over dxn evaluated at xn star so that's the general structure of the Jacobian. And then with the Jacobian with respect to u, instead of partially differentiating everything with respect to x1, x2, so on, you would do it with respect to u1, u2. And then if you multiply this out, you can see that you're actually just end up doing this original non-vector form linearization with each equation. But now since you have to account for all of them at once, you can just write them as a vector with these Jacobian matrix and these delta vectors.